We begin the day with a promise not to let history repeat itself. Today, the U.S.'s top diplomat for Europe issued the starkest warning yet to Russia not to invade Ukraine. The U.S. Department, State Department's Karen Donfrey today said the West intentionally held back with its response to Russia's annexation of Crimea seven years ago. She said the West will not hold back a second time. We have told Russia clearly and directly, publicly and privately, that if it does not choose this path of dialogue, if it commits renewed acts of aggression against Ukraine, we would take measures that we intentionally did not pursue in 2014, which would have massive consequences for their country. Well, Russian President Vladimir Putin apparently has gotten the message. Today, he said he wants immediate talks yet again with the U.S. and NATO. The topic, security guarantees for Russia. But White House sources say another video summit with President Biden is unlikely until Russia stops massing troops along its border with Ukraine. And that is not happening anytime soon. Today, Moscow released more video of military drills less than 50 kilometers from Ukraine's border. U.S. intelligence says some 70,000 Russian troops are now positioned all along the border in preparation of a possible invasion. Earlier today, Germany's new foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, spoke for the first time with her Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, and reportedly reaffirmed the position of the EU, NATO, and the U.S. that Ukraine's territory must not be violated. But Ukraine is not convinced of Berlin's new tough stance on Russia. Ukraine accuses Germany of blocking the delivery of anti-drone and anti-sniper systems from NATO, weapons they have a right to buy, according to Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky. Today, Baerbock tried to clarify Germany's position. Yesterday, I had a telephone conversation with the Ukrainian foreign minister and made it clear that we stand in full solidarity behind Ukraine, not only as Germany, but also as the EU and the G7. I also made it very clear that in the last few days, we've repeatedly stressed that Russia's aggressive actions would have massive economic and diplomatic consequences. The previous German government's position was not to provoke Russia. I hope the new government's position won't just be not to provoke Russia, but to support and defend Ukraine. Well, I'm joined once again this evening by Professor Michael Kimmich. He's a visiting fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, a professor of history at the Catholic University of America. He held the Russia-Ukraine portfolio at the U.S. State Department in the second term of the Obama administration. Professor Kimmich, it's good to have you back on the show. How much does this unified Western stance on Ukrainian sovereignty hinge on the new German government also singing the same tune as in Brussels and as in Washington? Well, certainly greater uniformity would make for a more uh, effective policy. But one should note that uh, President Biden, in a series of statements in the last couple of days, ruled out any direct uh, military involvement for the United States and Ukraine if it comes to a wider war uh, between, between Ukraine and Russia. And in terms of uh, economic sanctions, it seems like Europe and the United States are very much uh, on the same page. So I think the differences are there. Uh, but they're not uh, extraordinary, and I think that they're not uh, especially damaging at the moment. I want to ask you what we heard um, today from Karen Donfried, warning Russia that um, the West will not intentionally hold back the way it did back in 2014 when Russia illegally annexed um, Crimea. Is she telling the complete truth there? I mean, you were at the State Department. You were in the Obama administration. Did the U.S., did the West intentionally hold back after that annexation? I think Assistant Secretary Don Breed is telling, uh, is telling the complete truth. I think what she means is, uh, is, is something twofold. In 2014, uh, it took quite a while for the United States and the EU to organize a comprehensive sanctions package. Europe didn't join until the summer of 2014 after the shootdown of the Dutch airliner over Ukraine. So you had several months where the United States was pursuing sanctions and Europe was not. And I think if there were to be uh, you know, conflict in Ukraine this winter, I think you would see unified and swift action from Europe 
and the United States, but we can also speak in numeric terms. If the sanctions in 2014 were on a scale of one to 10 were a four, I think what you'd see now would be a seven or an eight. Uh, and I think what's being said between the lines is that the West would be willing to undertake sanctions that would be damaging to the West in some respects, damage Western business interests for the sake of really hitting Russia hard uh, economically. And those are not um, those are not empty words, I'm quite sure. Mm. Joe Biden was vice president um, at the time in 2014. He saw what happened. Um, has he learned maybe the lessons of the mistakes that were made by not having that unified front there? Is that why we're seeing a unified front with the U.S. and its European allies moving against Russia? Precisely. I think you're trying to see now more deterrence. I think what happened in the early months of 2014 was something that really just came out of the blue for Germany, for the United States. Uh, for Europe. People didn't expect the annexation of Crimea. They didn't expect the invasion of the Donbass. And that element of surprise was a great advantage in 2014 for Vladimir Putin. Now, I don't think that there is that element of surprise. Uh, and so that gives the West some deterrent options. And I think, you know, Foreign Minister Baerbock, Secretary Blinken, President Biden, Chancellor Schultz are going to try to use those deterrent mechanisms to the maximum. If you were advising uh, President Biden tonight, what would you tell him um, in terms of this new German government? Um, should the White House trust the new German government not to continue pursuing what has been called Angela Merkel's policy of not provoking Putin? Well, you know, I'm not sure if I agree with that characterization of Chancellor Merkel's policy. Germany was the building block. It was the keystone of the European sanctions policy from 2014 until the moment Chancellor Merkel left uh, office. So I think that, you know, Germany pursued a very robust policy toward Russia, but where Germany was emphatic, was clear, was that Germany was not going to get involved militarily in Ukraine. I think the new German government is going to think in exactly the same way. Uh, and as I said earlier, I think Washington actually thinks very similarly about that. So, uh, you know, there will be little hiccups of difference here and there, but the unity of vision is quite uh, comparable. And I assume that President Biden will see himself as building on the work that the Obama administration did. Uh, back in 2014. So it's a familiar problem set for him, uh, and, the, and the challenges are not insurmountable by any means. Well, Angela Merkel, she refused to back down in, in her support of the Nord Stream 2 natural gas pipeline between Russia and Germany. Um, killing that project now, would that be part of these massive consequences that Karen Donfried mentioned today? I think there's no doubt. In fact, I think that would probably be in some respects, the, the ceiling of the new policy, the, rather the floor of the new policy, uh, that it would be removal of Russia from the SWIFT code system, uh, you know, sort of crippling uh, sanctions. And in those policies, you would also have a termination of the Nord Stream 2 poli policy. So it would be one of several policies that would be chosen uh, to try to reverse Russia's course. And any of these policy decisions, they would have more economic ramifications for Europe than they would for the United States, particularly when we're talking about the delivery of national gas. So isn't that what Vladimir Putin is, is betting on, that he can make that point with Germany and with other European countries, making them back down, leaving the U.S. somewhat isolated? Well, there are several differences for, for Russia from 2014 that make me think that war is more probable now than not. One is that Russia's currency reserves at the moment are very high. Uh, another is that Russia has built a relationship with China that it did not have in 2014, and that's very much a backstop in this situation. China is the alternative market for Russian uh, energy uh, and will continue cooperating with Russia economically if things go badly uh, with uh, the West. And then finally, if Putin decides to pursue this military action in the short term, let's say in January, then Putin would have considerable leverage over Europe with uh, gas and energy supplies. So in that sense, uh, Europe and the United States might find themselves in quite different places. I have a hard time imagining the United States being isolated because I think that Europe and the U.S. would see the problem in similar terms, but it wouldn't be suffering quite as much uh, at Russian hands if that's, if that's what comes to pass. So Russia does have leverage in this situation. Okay. Professor Michael Kimmage, we appreciate your time and your insights tonight. I hope we'll be talking with you again. I'm sure we will very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much.